Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over Unit 1.5 of Cell Biology of the IB Biology Syllabus, which is the origin of cells. Anyways, before we get started, we're going to review the cell theory real quick, which was covered in video 1.1, so if you guys want to check that out, go ahead. Anyways, it states that all living things are composed of cells, cells are the smallest unit of life, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. If you guys remember, I covered the first two statements in depth um, in video 1.1. However, I kind of skimmed over this last statement. In this video, we're going to analyze this statement. All cells come from pre-existing cells. Before scientists believed this, however, they believed in spontaneous generation which states that all organisms and all cells appear out of thin air. Which makes no sense, but apparently did to the scientists at that time. Francesco Redi showed that flies had to come into contact with rotting meat for maggots to grow. Um, maggots didn't just simply grow out of thin air. They weren't produced spontaneously. This was one of the first evidences um, that disproved, were not disproved, but um, that acted against spontaneous generation. Lazaro Spallanzani showed that organisms only grow in containers of sterilized soup left open, but not in the ones closed. This was also an evidence going against spontaneous generation. However, even with these two strong pieces of evidence, some biologists remain convinced that spontaneous generation could occur if there was access to air. They said that the only reason why um, organisms didn't grow in the containers of sterilized soup closed was because the soup didn't have access to air and if they did spontaneous generation would have occurred which i guess is logical anyways um Sp Pasteur's test of spontaneous generation disproved um spontaneous generation once and for all because what he did is he placed samples of broth in swan necked flasks which are flasks normal flasks with a swan neck um and why did he use this what well what he tried to do was to um say that even if an an environment has access to air as in the swan necks if it doesn't come into contact with outside materials such as microbes spontaneous generation will not occur Anyway, so what he did is he boiled these, um, he boiled a broth, which killed all microbes in it. He had a control group, obviously, unboiled broth, and in unboiled broth, um, microbes are not killed, and therefore microbial growth occurred. Um, in the boiled broth, in one group, what he did is he left the swan necks um, on. In the other group, however, he broke the stem. Now. Air could still get in the unbroken flask. What couldn't get in was the microbes. In this, air could also get in, obviously, but microbes could also get in as well, unlike this group. Now, even in presence of air, spontaneous generation did not occur, as shown in this picture. No microbial growth was observed in the group where the swan neck was not broken. In this group, however, microbial growth occurred meaning that the microbes in the outside environment must have came inside. So, the conclusion of Pasteur's test, this is what you need to know, um, is that swan necks prevent microbes and air from getting into flasks, and no organisms were formed spontaneously. Therefore, spontaneous generation does not occur. Okay, so how did the first cell arise then? Because if all cells come from pre-existing cells, then there had to be at one point the first cell ever then the, but where did that come from so the consensus is if not specially created the first cell must have arisen from non-living material and what i mean by specially created is created by god or by some heavenly figure that is so divine to us. But anyways, the scientific conclusion is that the first cells must have arisen from non-living material. So, if for the first cells to arise, it would have required, one, a source of organic compounds because 
we know that cells are composed of organic compounds to a method for replicating genetic material because you know all living things need genetic material to reproduce and produce more cells and to produce subsequent cells and three a way to form a wall between the cell's internal environment and the external environment these are the three requirements for the for, for the production of the first cell i guess um, this is crucial um, so make sure you guys understand these three points. Anyway, so we're first going to examine the first point, um, a source of organic compounds. So in, you know, early, early, early history, before humans were here, before dinosaurs, there were no cells. Um, and, um, and cells may would have been produced from or um, from organic compounds now where did that organic compounds where did those organic compounds come from the miller array experiment um was the experiment that i guess kind of showed um an explanation to how organic compounds would have arisen so what they did is they attempted to recreate conditions on early earth which had no organic compounds they only had inorganic compounds um, so early earth had atmospheric water vapor inorganic molecules which include methane ammonia hydrogen gas and water lightning as an energy source and lack of free o2 so they found that smaller organic molecules could be formed using inorganic molecules like amino acids. Um, this showed that organic compounds can be formed from inorganic compounds. So the source of organic compounds, inorganic compounds. Two, the second point is that there had to be a method for replicating genetic material because if there was a first cell, in order for the second cell to arise, genetic material had to be passed down. Um, to our understanding today. Anyways, replicating DNA is a very complex com progress involving many enzymes. To form enzymes, genes need to be replicated. A possible solution to this is that RNA was the original genetic material since some RNA has catalytic properties and can catalyze its own replication. I kind of rushed through this, so I'll explain it more. Replicating DNA is very complex and it requires enzymes. However, to form enzymes, genes need to be replicated. It's kind of like a circle. If genes are needed to produce enzymes, but um, enzymes are needed to replicate genes, then it it's like a circle that you know you can never arrive at a conclusion if that makes sense. So, but however, RNA has catalytic properties, and therefore it wouldn't have um, required enzymes to per, um, to catalyze the re the replication of it, and that would be an explanation for the second point. Anyways, third point and last point is a way to f um, the last requirement. I'm sorry, is a way to form a barrier between the cell's internal and external environment because if they didn't have that barrier, they would have died. Um, and we went over this in unit 1.3, I think, the cell membrane unit, a cell membrane video. Um, and in that video, we you know established that phospholipids naturally assemble into bilayers in water, which form cell membranes like that. So if you guys want to know more about cell membranes, make sure to check my video on that. Anyway, so that's how the first cell arised or that those are the requirements for the first cell to arise and most scientists believe that the first cell was prokaryotic which makes sense because prokaryotic cells are more simple now then how did eukaryotic cells arise the most popular explanation now is the endosymbi endosymbiotic theory symbiosis is a close long-term relationship between two species um states that um so basically the endosymbiotic theory states that mitochondria which um you know partake in anaerobic respiration and chloroplasts which partake in photosynthesis 
Um, if you guys remember, I went over organelles in unit 1.2. Anyways, we're once free living prokaryotes. So these two um, organelles were once prokaryotes. Mitochondria in chloroplasts were ingested by larger prokaryotes and developed a symbiotic relationship with them, according to the endosymbiotic theory. Over time, the two prokaryotes evolved into an organelle of the cell. And now, um, chloroplasts and mitochondria cannot survive outside of our cell, of, of a normal cell, sorry. Um, so evidence for the endosymbiotic theory include that mitochondria and chloroplasts have similarities with prokaryotes, suggesting they evolve from independent prokaryotes. They have own, their own genes on a circular naked DNA molecule, just like prokaryotes. They have their own 70S ribosomes, which is the size for the ribosomes on prokaryotes. They transcribe DNA and use the mRNA to synthesize some of their own proteins. They even synthesize some of their own proteins, which is strong, strong, strong evidence for, um, for chloroplasts and mitochondria once being their own separate cell. And lastly, they're only produced by division of pre-existing mitochondria and chloroplasts. They aren't produced internally in the, inside the cell. They must be divided. Um, they must come from existing mitochondria and chloroplasts. Um, they also have a double membrane, um, which um, unlike any other organelle except for the nucleus, due to being ingested by endocytosis. And endocytosis, I'm pretty sure I went over in the membrane transport unit. So if you guys want to check that out, make sure you guys do. And if you get, as you guys are learning bio, you guys should be making connections from each unit to each unit because it makes it easier for um, everything to be memorized. Um, and as I said earlier, mitochondria and chloroplasts cannot um, live independently, independently no longer. Anyways, that was it for today. Um, thanks for watching my video. Um, make sure you guys subscribe and like if you want more content. Thank you.